Good morning, YouTube. We just returned from an incredible five night camping trip to Katmai National Park in Alaska. Now this trip has been on our bucket list for a very long time and it definitely did not disappoint. Now we were fortunate enough to get the permits all the way back in January, which gave us between January and July to prepare and plan. And although we did a ton of preparation, when we landed on that beach, there was still so much that we felt unprepared for and a lot of things that we learned that we wished we would have known going in. So over the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna do several videos about the park and we're gonna review all the images and all the footage. And I promise you, I came away with a ton of footage and images, about half a terabyte's worth. But in this video specifically, I wanna do two things. In the first half, I'm gonna do a general overview of the park. I'm gonna kinda of give you a lay of the land and give you some tips and things that we learned that we wish we would have known. And then in the second half of the video, which will start at this minute mark, I'm gonna talk specifically about the photography. So the gear that I used and some tips and tricks, and of course, things that I did well and what I didn't do well, and really just anything that I might help you as you plan for your photography trip to Katmai National Park. But that's a lot of jibber jabber and we got a lot to cover. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, this is the map of the Katmai National Park area. When you land on your float plane or water taxi, you're gonna land right here on this beach. When you get to the beach, there are almost always bears either walking along the shore or sleeping on the beach. You can see these here just behind all the planes and then this guy here that I was pretty certain was dead, but don't worry, he's just fine. Now your first step will be to move over to the visitor center and the rangers will escort you there and you'll have to attend what's called bear school. Now this is a 10 to 15 minute orientation. It gives you a ton of great information on the park and the rules and is also a great opportunity to ask the rangers questions. They're extremely helpful. If you're camping from here, you're going to go about a quarter mile to the campground. And before you head there, I highly recommend grabbing one of the carts. They have these carts with large rubber wheels. You could pack all your bags on them and then drag it to the campground. My wife and I did not know about this and we carried over hundred pounds of gear that quarter mile and it sucked. So definitely grab one of those carts before you head out. From here, you can head over to Brooks Lodge. Now, if you're staying at Brooks Lodge, you'll see the cabins as you walk up, but even if you're not staying at the lodge, it is a great resource for campers and day trippers alike because they have hot coffee, they have food, and they even have a bar. I believe the bar opens at one or two o'clock, I can't quite remember, but it stays open until 11 p.m. Now this is a great place for a few reasons. One, they have this awesome fireplace that you can sit around and have a nice cup of coffee and dry off if needed. But two, if you go in between their meal times and they post their meal times, they have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And in the off times, you can grab a table and use their outlets to charge your batteries, back up your photos or whatever. So this was a frequent stop for us that we would go once or twice a day just to grab a hot cup of coffee and relax for a bit. Additionally, if you are camping here, they do have hot showers available for campers and it's $7 for a 10 minute shower and they give you a fresh towel, which is great because you don't have to bring your own. Now, directly across from from the lodge you're going to see a small building now it has two sides on the far end there's a store where you can buy chips candy t-shirts things like that and then on the front side is where you would book any of your activities so whether you want to take the bus to the valley of 10,000 smokes or you want to do the river walk or any other activities you would book right across the lodge in that front end i would recommend booking any of these well in advance of your trip as they fill up quickly from the lodge area, it's about a quarter mile until you get to the first platform, which is the lower river platform. Now you'll notice here that there's these dotted lines. This is all a boardwalk and you walk along it and you will be elevated above the area below. And there's this nice bridge here that crosses the water. Now there's a lot to see along this area. You'll frequently see bears, even a mama bear with her cubs was generally in this area. And you'll be able to see all the salmon and fishermen and all the things on the shore. However, they ask that you do not stop in this dotted area because what will happen is one person stops, then a couple people stop to see what they're looking at and all of a sudden you've got a gaggle of 10 to 15 people and what will happen is it'll actually intimidate the bears and these platforms are raised so that the bears can travel below them. And if you've got a group of 10 to 15 people hanging out here, the bears won't want to go that way and will actually walk all the way around. So the whole goal here is to be able to observe these animals and not disrupt them. So do not stop in this area as tempted as you may be. 
make your way to this lower river platform, which is just a fantastic place to view the bears. And even the wildlife out here, you'll see some uh, eagles and other animals who are coming to the shore to catch fish. From here, it's a little less than a half a mile to get to the restrooms. Now you'll know that you're at the restrooms when you see the fork to Brooks Falls and Lake Brooks, and it is the only restroom in the area. So make sure you stop and use the restroom before heading to Brooks Falls, because what you don't want to do is wait in line for an hour to get to the falls, only to have to lose your spot to come back to the restroom. And you can see here on the map that this is more of a paved wide road, and then when you get onto the Brooks Trail, it's very narrow. Now you really have to be careful anytime you're walking in the park, but especially once you get onto the trail because those bears, despite being so big, are very quiet and you may not see them or hear them until you're right on top of them. So it's helpful to walk in a group, speak loudly, and keep your eyes open for any bears that might be sleeping along or on the side of the trail. And something I want to point out is that you're not allowed to carry food anywhere in the park unless you're carrying it to and from a food cache. So I want to point out where the food caches are. You have one here where this picnic table is, you have some at the campground, and then you have one at Lake Brooks. So if you are going to the Brooks platform or the Riffles platform or the lower platform, you should not have any food on you and you cannot eat anywhere else in the park. At this junction here, there's a large covered waiting area and this is where the ranger will usually be posted to let you know that there is a wait and you have to get your name added to the list. Once your name is on the list, you can either hang out in the covered area and get your gear ready, or you can head over to the Riffles platform. On the Riffles platform, you can also use your tripod in a regular tripod configuration, and you'll find that this platform is usually not very crowded. Now this is a great place if you're interested in seeing cubs and mama bears, as this is where they'll usually hang out. In this area here, they can just wait in the water for um, uneaten scraps to flow down river where they can grab them without very much competition. So it's very common to see young bears and their mothers here in this riffle platform area. Once it's your turn, the rangers will come and grab you from the platform or the waiting area and you can head to the Brooks Falls platform. Now a few things I wanna point out. You get 30 minutes on the platform. So they'll tell you what time you're heading in and then they expect you to come out after 30 minutes. There will be a ranger also posted on the platform and if you have not come out after 30 minutes, they'll start calling your name to pull you off. Additionally, on the falls platform, you cannot use your tripod in the tripod configuration. You can, however, use your tripod as a monopod and this is what I did. Now, a few people seem to not know this. There were a lot of photographers there that were surprised that you were able to have a monopod or a tripod used as a monopod and thought you had to shoot handheld. That is not the case. They just don't want the legs extended as it would take up too much space. What I found a lot of success with was putting my tripod in the monopod configuration and then putting it in the corner of one of these two locations here. What that allowed me to do is use my hand to hold the monopod tight to the railing and that gave me a nice stable base to shoot from. I will say that when there are people on the platform, which is usually the case, the platform will shake quite a bit. So it is difficult even with using this configuration to get really sharp video and images. However, it's much better than trying to carry that heavy camera and lens for 30 minutes trying to get handheld shots. The final area that I wanna call out here is Lake Brooks. This is one of, in my opinion, the most underrated areas in the park. On one of the rainy afternoons, my wife and I spent about three to four hours out here and we didn't see another person the entire time. It's about three quarters of a mile from the restroom to this area here. But what's so great about it is there's a food cache, there's a covered picnic table area, and there's an electric fence around it not to mention a set of bathrooms. So what that means is we were able to take our breakfast and lunch, skip the falls platforms and head directly to this food cache here, put our food in the storage area. We were able to explore the lake, have breakfast and lunch uh, in this covered area and really just get away from the crowds. It was extremely peaceful and it was one of my favorite times on this trip. So if you have the time, I would definitely explore this area. We'll be talking more about the images from this area in a couple videos in the future. Okay, now you have a general lay of the land. Let's talk about a few more things before we get to the photography. First is transportation. We took a float plane to and from King Salmon to Katmai National Park. This was an amazing experience and I highly recommend it, but there are some things that I want you to be aware of. First of all, these planes fly largely by line of sight. So when weather rolls in, as it did for us, it causes a lot of flight delays and cancellations. All of the folks who had day trips on the day that we flew were canceled and they only flew the campers. 
And the reason was that they didn't know if they could get the day trippers back as if the weather was rolling in and getting worse, they wouldn't be able to go get them so they never flew them out in the first place. This caused issues for us as well, as coming home we had a tight connection and we weren't going to be able to catch our flight if there were any delays. So we actually flew home a day early to make sure that we were going to catch that connection. Now with that said, I flew Katmai Air, which is where I got this badass hat. I highly recommend them. Their prices were reasonable, they were extremely flexible, and they worked with us all along the way. I don't think I would fly with anybody else. Now with that said, when we came home a day early, we didn't have any accommodations planned because we weren't planning to come home a day early. That was a judgment call that we made as the weather was getting worse and we were worried we wouldn't be able to fly out in the morning. We were very fortunate to find Margo at Bear Trail Cabins, and I cannot recommend this place enough. The campsite was $50 a night, and it came with a hot shower, and it was absolutely beautiful. I'm going to show you some pictures here of the campsite so you know what to expect, but I can't say enough kind words about Margo. Just a truly wonderful person, and we're so appreciative that we got to meet her and stay at her wonderful campsites. Finally, let's talk about the reason we're all here. Photography. Now there's a handful of topics that I want to cover to best prepare you for a photography trip to Katmai National Park. If you only listen to one piece of advice that I have today, let this be it. If you can, do the river walk. We didn't even know this was a thing and we were extremely lucky to get a last minute slot. You can actually go down to the river and view the bears at eye level. You still have to keep at least 50 yards away and observe all the same rules as always. But having the ability to get an entirely different perspective is just an incredible thing. There are two options to do this. You can either pay $6 for a permit and go on your own for a self-guided tour, or you can pay $175 for a guided tour. Now the guided tour gives you waterproof boots and waders, which you're gonna need as you stand in the river. Now $175 isn't cheap, but having the guide was really worth the peace of mind. As he was keeping his eye out for bears sneaking up on us, which was happening constantly, while Yana and I could just enjoy watching the bears. At one point, I'm looking down a 400 millimeter lens and the guide says, okay, we have a bear approaching, we need to move away. And we started walking away. Before we knew it, we had six or seven bears all around us. And it seemed that any direction that we would go, we would run directly into a bear. The guide kept us calm and got us to safety. I don't think we're ever in any real danger, but having the peace of mind of following somebody that does this every day allowed me to just enjoy myself rather than question all of my life choices. Now, let's talk about a few tips on gear. I want to start with focal lengths because this is where I spent the bulk of my research before the trip. I didn't know how various areas would look at different focal lengths and I found a lot of conflicting information. Everybody was recommending something from 200 to 600 millimeters on the Falls platform. I ended up bringing three lenses on the trip. My 400 millimeter, which was my primary lens, it was on my stills camera about 75% of the time. My 70 to 200, which I primarily used for video and I barely touched for stills. And then my 24 to 70, which was what I used for my landscape shots. And this brief footage here that just shows how many bears there were at the falls. But I really just didn't use it much overall. Now I'm gonna show you a few clips with each focal length so that you can see how each focal length looks at the falls and what the view looks like. If I were only able to bring one lens, it would have been my 400 millimeter lens. Almost 100% of my keeper images of the bears that you're gonna see next week were with the 400 millimeter, including this one right here over my shoulder. At 400 millimeters, you're able to get the full bear in the frame with enough space for the fish and a little bit of water. I wouldn't wanna to go too much tighter than this, although a five or 600 millimeter would have been nice to get some of the bears that are on the back half of the falls, like big old Otis off in his office. If you have a teleconverter, it certainly wouldn't hurt to bring it, 
I didn't end up bringing mine as it leaves my images a little bit too soft and the detail in the scales of the fish and the fur of the bear were crucial to me. Now next, let's talk about redundancy. This is a big one. This is not a cheap trip. As I mentioned, this is likely a once in a lifetime opportunity for my wife and I. You're gonna travel a long ways and you're gonna pay a significant amount of money to do it. The last thing you wanna do is have a critical piece of your kit fail, ruining your entire trip. It's exactly what happened to me. <laughs> By day three of torrential rain, my Canon 5DSR would not turn on. Additionally, my 7200 would rapidly switch from autofocus to manual focus, making it completely unusable. Although I was able to get by without the 7200, losing my primary stills body was a major issue. I was completely heartbroken. Now this was something I knew could happen, so I brought my old stills body as a backup. However, if I were gonna do this trip again, I would have just gone ahead and rented a second body that was the same as my primary stills body or asked a buddy if I could borrow one. I would have kept the 70 to 200 on the spare and the 400 millimeter on my primary. The primary would stay on the tripod with the 70 to, two, uh, 70 to 200 strapped on my shoulder in case a mama bear and her cubs approach the platform and this way I can get a quick shot. The added benefit, of course, is that when you're a giant moron who doesn't properly protect your camera from days worth of moisture, you have a backup as a failure. Or you just not be dumb like me, there's always that as an option too. But all jokes aside, gear does break. So having a backup, even if it's a lower quality like the one I brought, it's better than nothing, so bring it. Next brings me to memory. Now I brought a full terabyte of memory cards on this trip. I always duplicate my cards, so that gave me about 500 gigs of available data for the five days. I ended up using a little bit over 300 gigabytes, and admittedly most of that was 4K footage, which eats up a ton of memory. But even still, I would, have want, I would not have wanted to have less. Memory is cheap and it's lightweight. So think about how much you realistically need and then bring at least double. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is run out of memory cards. Now next, I want to talk about shutter speeds. Freezing the bears and the flying fish and the moving water requires very fast shutter speeds. I was usually shooting between 1 2,000th and 1 2,500th of a second. This not only gave me tax sharp bears, it also captured the water droplets and the fish scales and whatever else was flying through the air. Even the scales on the fish are tax sharp and the fish are hurtling through the air. Now with that said, one of my favorite images from the trip was taken at 1 20th of a second. Now next week I'll show that image, but I was able to get a shot of Grazer, which is my favorite mama bear, perfectly still perched atop the falls. At 1 20th of a second, the water went smooth, giving a great contrast to the incredible detail in the frozen bear's fur. Now this image, to me, perfectly shows how focused these bears are. Playing with the shutter speed gives you a creative control and allows you to enter some narrative into the images. Now I briefly want to talk about focal length. When you're at the Brooks Falls specifically, like I said, you're going to be battling with those shutter speeds. For the most part, you're going to want to be a very fast shutter speed, which means cranking your ISO. I saw a lot of folks there with those mega f2.8 and f2 lenses, which are just massive and heavy. Uh, and although they look very impressive, I was very curious to see whether or not they were stopping down because my 400 millimeter lens, which is just a piddly 5.6, um, I was still stopping down to 6.3 and 7.1 because at 5.6 I wasn't able to get the fish, the snout, and the eyes sharp and I felt like I had to go to 6.3 or 7.1 to get all of those sharp. And even then the back of the bear would start to fall out of focus which was fine with me. But when you're at 400 millimeters, your depth of field is very thin. And at 40 meters away from these bears on the falls, you really don't have a ton to work with. So I wouldn't worry too much about bringing the fastest lens. I would take whatever you can carry and whatever's convenient for you. Because in all likelihood, in order to get all of that sharp, you're gonna stop down anyway. At the end of the day, don't be afraid to experiment with different focal lengths, shutter speeds, and apertures. The bears aren't going anywhere. You have plenty of time. Speaking of time, Plan your time at the Brooks platform wisely. The Falls platform is open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. They close overnight to allow the bears to use the trails to travel undisturbed. The best light is in the late afternoon as the sun will be shining directly on the bears' faces and giving beautiful light. However, in terms of crowds, the best time to view the platforms are at 7 a.m. when it first opens and right around dinner time when most of the campers and folks staying in the lodge go back to catch dinner. Additionally, the last float plane leaves at 6 p.m. So day trippers taking the float planes out will be gone around 5 p.m. We had a lot of success getting there at 7 a.m., often having the entire platform to ourselves for as much as 30 to 45 minutes. 
The 4.30 to 5.30 hour was also great timing, as usually the crowds had sufficiently thinned by then to eliminate the weight on the platform. Now, if you're planning a day trip, you of course won't be able to visit at either of these times. I'm sorry to tell you that if you're there for a day trip, you're likely gonna wait and probably for a long time. Make good use of that time by exploring the Riffles platform while you wait. The falls are great, there's no doubt about that. However, I noticed a lot of the photographers that I was talking to really weren't even bothering to look at other areas. I found this so strange to me. My favorite moments from this trip were not on the Brooks Falls platform. The images you get from the platforms are undoubtedly incredible, but there's more to Katmai than just the images or just the platform. It's the experience of being in this surreal place. My favorite part of this place was watching the bears in their natural habitat, getting an up close view of their behaviors and how they interact with one another. And what is so amazing to me is how different the bears are in each area of the park and therefore how different their interactions and behaviors are. If you fixate too much on the falls, you're gonna miss out on all these other great areas, all of which have plenty of opportunity for great images and great experiences. Additionally, Brooks Lake and Dumpling Mountain, though not good for bear viewing, are absolutely gorgeous and worth the time of checking out if you have the time. Okay, well, this was a lot to cover. I'm sorry for the long-winded video. However, if you're planning a trip to Katmai or just have a vague interest in this amazing place, hopefully I have given you some helpful information. If you have any questions or there's anything you want to discuss, just shoot me an email. My email's in the description. I would be more than happy to share everything that I know. But that's going to be it for me this week. Make sure you come back next week to review the images from this trip. Otherwise, have a fantastic weekend and get out there and make some images.